Corinthians 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 
In the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians, we have read the Apostle Paul dealing with the fighting and divisions that were occurring in the Corinthian church by addressing the centrality of the cross. The message of the cross is not worldly wisdom, but it is the wisdom of God which shames the wise of this world. God chose the cross of Christ so that no one could boast in their own power or their own wisdom or their own knowledge. Further, Paul made the point that the message he and the other preachers who came to them, that they possessed the Spirit of God, so the words that they taught were the Spirit's words, that is, the very words of God, and not human words or wisdom. Now here in chapter 3, and for our next study in chapter 4, Paul will continue to put an end to the divisions that are occurring in the Corinthian church by changing their way of thinking. Paul will identify their problems and their thought processes and teach them how they ought to think. In verse 1, Paul speaks to the heart of the issue. He tells the Corinthians that he could not speak to them as spiritual people, but as fleshly, worldly people. He had to speak to them as infants in Christ, in fact. Paul had to feed them with milk, he says, while he was with them, which was fine at the time, but even now, as he writes these words, they still need milk, and they're not ready for solid food. That is a sad condition, yet I think we understand the image. We expect babies to eat milk, but once teeth start coming in, we move them to solid food so that they can grow properly. What is needed in the beginning must be discarded later for proper growth. Paul tells them that they were needing milk when he began with them. The problem is, is they still need milk, which is their problem. Their jealousies and striving with others show that they are of the flesh, and they're not behaving spiritually, but fleshly, because they're not growing. Now, think about Paul's definition of worldliness. Worldliness and living according to the flesh is not merely immorality issues. Worldliness is a way of thinking and believing. When we look to the world for our standards and attitudes and values and worth and hope, then we become worldly. When we fight with other Christians and argue with other Christians, we're being worldly. When we have jealousies for others, then we are being worldly. There is supposed to be growth away from those things and not continuing in those things. Paul expects growth and not remaining in the same place in life spiritually. Divisions come because we're not growing up to spiritual maturity. Causing problems means that you're still an infant. You're still acting like a spiritual baby and worldly thinking in the cause. Now, understanding this principle is important because it is important for us as a church to encourage growth by teaching meat. Too many churches don't want depth from the scriptures. Just be agreeable with feel-good topical lessons. Don't tell us about our sin. Tell us that we are doing well. Don't go too deep now. Just teach us on the things that we already know. Notice that this would be a disaster to our growth. We can't grow if we're not fed meat. We need depth to grow. So from time to time, we do need to get into hard texts and talk about hard teachings. And hopefully as we're doing that, that won't make us yearn for the days when we had the milk, but will cause us instead to enjoy the challenge to grow into what God is speaking. So many people turn away from Jesus. Remember? During the life of Jesus, when he would teach hard things, they would walk away. That's why we spent in our Wednesday night Bible class uh, almost a year and a half on the book of Isaiah. I picked Isaiah because I had never taught Isaiah before. So I needed that meat and you needed that meat. We need to desire that together, desire the depth of that. And it wasn't always easy, was it? There is some hard stuff in the book of Isaiah to try to figure out and try to wrap our heads around. We need to desire to learn more and not just be satisfied with surface level understanding, 
like these Corinthians were. So, who are Apollos? What is Paul? They are merely servants of the Lord. God is the power and he receives our allegiance. The person who plants and the person who waters, Paul says, is nothing. Nothing. And that is proper and right spiritual thinking. It's not about me and it's not about you. It's God who gets the praise. Only God can give the increase. Planting and watering are equal tasks, and God will give his reward for that labor. But it does not matter who plants or who waters. We don't, we're not ranked by job or task in the church. Think about the roles and responsibilities in the local church. God gave shepherds, deacons, evangelists, teachers, and the like, and they're not to be ranked. One task or role is not greater or higher than any other task or role. This would be as foolish as saying that my feet are more or less important than my hands are. They're different. They all have, they have equal value and they're equally needed, but they have different functions. So what is the proper perspective of those who work in the church? Paul and Apollos call themselves God's fellow workers. There in verse 9, at the end of that verse, God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. If Paul and Apollos are simply servants and fellow workers, then this tells us what we ought to think of ourselves. We're nothing more than servants and workers in God's kingdom too. How sad it is to see shepherds or deacons or preachers who think that they are important. We are all equally important. You are God's field, God's building, Paul says. Our view must be that we are simply servants working in God's field. We're working, helping build God's building. We do not receive any glory. It's God's field. It's God's building. You're not my field. You're not my building. You belong to God. I'm just trying to throw seed and water the planted seed. Someone once asked me, Aaron, how many folks have you baptized in your time as a gospel preacher? And the answer is, I have no idea. I've never kept count. Because it's not about getting people wet, is it? And the reason that people come to be baptized, it's rarely because the preacher said something and it just was all inspiring and boy, I had to be baptized in the same hour of the night. Sometimes you'll say something that'll prick somebody's heart, but, but lots of times they've, they've already been thinking about it. Others have been working on them. Others have been leading by example or teaching them. And so just because the preacher is the one doing the baptizing doesn't mean, oh, he can notch one there on his belt. No, that's awful. That's insane. One person plants, another person waters, and it's God who gives the increase. The glory belongs to God and no one else. Paul presses this truth even further in verse 10. Notice here, Jesus is the foundation any foundation that is laid must be the foundation of Jesus. And that's what Paul said he did in Corinth. He preached Jesus crucified and laid the foundation of Jesus. Apollos has been building on that foundation. And I believe Paul would say himself as also building on that foundation since he will visit this church twice and write to this church at least three letters trying to bring them to maturity in Christ. We cannot build a foundation on other people for that'll fail. I'm amazed how many churches are built on people. So many churches are built on the preacher. The preacher's name is not anything. We first started doing YouTube videos. It was at the beginning of COVID and we were still trying to figure out how to do live stream videos. I had a YouTube channel that I used to watch YouTube videos with. So we started putting them on there. Uh, because it was there, it was convenient, and we were figuring it out. But by the end of the year, I realized that's not good for 
the church's live stream videos to be under my name. And so the church got its own YouTube channel. Because it's not about me. Preachers are not the foundation, but are builders on the foundation of Jesus. God owns the building, and he will judge the quality of the work of the builders. Notice there, that's verses 12 through 15 here, in discussion about that work and which one is doing what. Paul's reward is their spiritual success. He wants to see them spiritually succeed because he has put his time into building on this foundation in Corinth. I believe any leader who truly loves the Lord feels the same way. My joy is in your spiritual success and maturity. Paul felt pain when troubles arose in the churches that he planted. Notice there in verse 15, If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. No one wants to see their work burned up. We don't want to labor in vain. How important it is then for the church to have proper, godly, spiritual leaders. I've seen too many churches where the trial of fire came and all was lost. The church divided. Souls were lost. People were hurt. Some left the faith. Many leaders will be held accountable for this. Many preachers and many shepherds will be held accountable for their actions in how they treated God's field and the quality of the material they used to build God's building. What we do is serious because we are God's temple, verse 16. And whoever destroys God's temple, God himself will destroy. A person is doomed by starting strife or causing problems. Preachers are doomed when they do not build with the quality materials of God's word. Shepherds are doomed when they do not lead and assist the flock with the quality materials of God's word. We will be held accountable for what we do in the body of Jesus Christ. Strife, anger, friction, and divisions are no small things to our Lord. Whoever destroys God's temple, God will destroy. What a frightening passage that is. And think about this truth as in regards to the church at Corinth. They have all kinds of doctrines wrong. They misunderstand the resurrection. They mistreat the Lord's Supper. They're suing each other. They're causing others to stumble. They're quarreling over spiritual gifts. Yet Paul does not tell people to leave. Paul does not tell people to start a fight. Paul does not tell people to make a stink. Paul does not tell people to be angry. Paul tells them to be spiritual. Paul tells them to act in maturity. Grow up and understand your actions. That you will be held accountable if you are hurting God's field. Focus on your spiritual work and be ready for the fire. Now this naturally brings us to this next paragraph in verse 18. Do not deceive yourselves. Your worldly wisdom or fleshly behavior is not useful or needed. Have a proper view of yourself. We need to become fools to the world so that we may be wise in God. If we are wise to the world, we do not have the wisdom of God. Have a proper view of yourself. Understand that God knows your mind. He knows your thoughts. Watch yourself because he knows if you are behaving like spiritual immature infants. Further, verse 21, have a proper view of others. Don't boast in other people. You have everything in Jesus Christ. You have all things. You do not just have Paul. You have all of us, he says. You belong to Christ. Understand your actions. Be careful with your words. Think before you speak and act. Ask yourself, am I destroying God's building? Am I merely thinking about myself? Am I behaving as a spiritually immature person? Am I thinking rightly about other people? Am I holding the opinion of some other spiritual leader up so that I have become a follower of him rather than Christ and his word? This present life clamors for us to be treated as if we are worthy of ultimate respect. Don't fall for it. We are all here by God's grace and God gets the glory. 
Focus on the work of the kingdom. See God's field. See God's building. What can I do to build up this temple of God? If I am found tearing down this church, then I am held accountable to God. And God promised he will destroy those who do that. Let us not deceive ourselves, but carefully consider our words, carefully consider our actions, so that we may not be causes of difficulty, strife, fighting, or division. Next time, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I look forward to diving deeper with you in what the Apostle Paul has to say. Until then, have a great day. So long. Oh.